Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, that's the show for uh, condo living and for people who live and work in the con condominium community in the state of Hawaii. Thank you for joining us. I've got as my guest today, and this is, you know, in conjunction with, you know, a series of programs we're doing about building safety. And, you know, especially after the, the that condo collapse in Florida, we've had a lot of, you know, inquiries about, you know, doing shows to give you information on how to keep your building safe. So I'm really happy to have with me today. I've got Kyle Pineo, and he's with Birding Wild, who's uh, it's a law firm in Hawaii and on the mainland. Hi, Kyle. Hi, thanks for having me. Okay, thanks for being with us. Uh, uh, Kyle, why don't you give us some information about your firm? What does your firm do? Tell the viewers what, they, what, they, what you do. Birding and Wild is a full service condominium association law firm with 39 lawyers. And Tyler Birding, and the teams that work with him, and I'm on one of the, those teams, primarily handle the condominium construction defects portion of our work. And Steve Weil primarily handles the general counsel work, and Steve Weil and also the teams that work with him. The firm has been representing owners for over 33 years with clients from luxury high rises to mid to low rise multifamily buildings to single family homes. And the firm is headquartered in California and has a Hawaii office, which is where I work as a construction defect litigator. And, and you're licensed to practice in Hawaii, right? Yes, I am licensed to practice here in Hawaii and I live out here and work out here. And I'm also licensed in California. Okay, you know, and, and uh, one of the, the big, you know, topics that we get, you know, a lot of questions about is building safety. So why don't you tell our viewers, you know, what, what specifically, I mean, what kind of special work does your firm do uh, to assist uh, associations in making sure that their buildings are safe? We work with associations of varying, I'll call them ages, Jane. We work with younger buildings that were, are built less than 10 years ago that still have legal recourse to potentially seek compensation from a developer for any construction defects. We also work with buildings who are trying to perform reconstruction or update or repair conditions that the association has determined to require updating. And we've, and then also we've worked with older association buildings, those older than 10 years, sometimes many 10, 20, 30 years old on addressing possible building and structural issues or building waterproofing issues that can result in structural issues and, and those types of safety issues. But primarily because only one of those three that I've just mentioned have uh, legal rights, typically. Um, we primarily work with buildings that are younger than 10 years old and that have a legal capability under the law to seek compensation from a developer. Well, let's talk about <clears throat> some of these younger buildings. And, you know, we're talking about like a brand new building, right? Something that, you know, uh, was built within the last 10 years. And so let's take a building that, you know, um, was completed maybe a year ago. And, you know, the developer is there and he's, he's selling, you know, the units and, and, and typically they control the board. I mean, they might set up an association, but, you know, they, they sit on the board and they, they hold, you know, positions on the board of directors. And at some point, I think it's after they sell 50% 50, 50 of the building, then they kind of have to step back. But all of, all of these brand new condominiums, the developer has certain reserved rights. And then uh, and, and at, at some point, the developer goes away. And you know, this is a brand new building. It's brand new, spanking new, supposed to be everything works, right? So why should anybody be worried about the building you know, having a problem? The reason why associations should be concerned or should investigate, in our opinion, whether it, a building has a problem, Jane, 
is that if a developer or builder builds a building component incorrectly, that defect exists at the moment it is constructed. So the, the incorrect building materials or building installation is present from the very beginning. Now, if you have some type of building deficiency like that, uh, water typically, which is our, the primary culprit for damage in our defect cases, water at a, for example, at a wall that is improperly waterproof can start to get into the building immediately. And for many of these types of building components, they're actually hidden from view. So it's a, a homeowner likely wouldn't be able to identify whether there is water intrusion into a, the interior of a building wall or an exterior wall. So a lot of this damage can go without being noticed. So it's in, incumbent on an association or it's important for an association to have an idea of the health of its building and whether there is water getting into components that ordinary people cannot see. Okay, so let's say you've got a, a building that has a construction defect that you can't see. And they don't, you know, and, and so, you know, it, it, it starts, you know, maybe allowing water in the building, maybe through windows that aren't, you know, installed correctly or some pipes, you know, that are done and nobody can tell, right? And let's say, the building decides, you know, after after a while, they've had all these problems with water leaks and they go out and hire a structural engineer. And this is like 10 years after the building is completed, or maybe year 12. What is the problem of waiting that long to do something about this construction defect? What's the problem with waiting? The problem, Jane, is that every building and every association has a limited amount of time to bring a claim to seek compensation for construction defects. So you mean so, if they wait too long, they can't sue? Yeah, if you wait too long, you lose it. So that, that presents a significant risk for associations, especially those that are around the 10-year mark. But we would argue that waiting till the 10-year mark is risky because you run, you could potentially face problems that take a significant amount of time to investigate. And if you start investigating them right at the end uh, before you run out of time, um, you could potentially lose the claim. And so, the, but before I get too deep into that, Jane, I, I got to explain that for new buildings, like new condominium buildings, there are deadlines that a, a condominium building has that start immediately after construction. Now the statute that applies has a particular definition on that starting, or has a, a unique definition on that starting point, which allows some ambiguity and some argument by lawyers. But for purposes of this conversation, I'll just say that starting point begins at the end of construction. So for new buildings, there are outside, there's an art outside limit, and then also inside limit or deadline to when an association can bring claims. So the outside deadline that you typically may hear is 10 years, 10 years, and that's called a, a statute of repose. Repose means the deadline starts after a specific given moment in time, uh, based on a, an event, which in this case is the construction of the building. So, New buildings, they have 10 years. However, there are also inside limits that can override that 10 year period. So you have various claims that you could bring as an association to seek recovery against a developer. Some of those claims are breach of contract claims. So we'll call those contract claims. Other claims are what we call tort claims. You may hear of negligence, or various types of claims like that. So in Hawaii, you have two years to bring a negligence claim or tort claim, and six years to bring a breach of contract claim. And I'll go through some examples here to kind of identify how these limits work with one another, because it's very important. It's, it is confusing, but 
And that's why it's important for an association to have an understanding of what these deadlines are, because it's very easy to, to blow past them. So there's a 10 year outside limit and then two and six year inside limits. So that's, we have that. So let's use an example like you mentioned, Jane, in year one. In year one, an association discovers a construction defect. And there is an argument about when, a, when a, an association discovers a defect, but we'll ignore that now and just say the association discovered the defect in year one. Ordinarily, you would think new building, I've got 10 years or the association has 10 years. This one year has gone by, so the association has nine more years to investigate. Why should we investigate now? We have plenty of time to look into those those nasty construction defects later. The problem with that is you only have a two year period from the moment you discover an issue for your negligence or tort claims. So you discover in year one, that means you have only until year three to bring your claims or else those claims are gone forever. So in, from year one, you would also have six years. So year seven, you would have another deadline to bring your contract claims. So let's say you're an association and you say, well, we've only had one year to pass by. We think it's, it would be smart to begin investigating during year seven or eight. You could, but then, and then you also discover um, various construction defects during that time. You could have easily blown through your two year period and your six year period and lost almost all, if not all, of your claims and potential for recovery. So what you're saying is that even for these brand new buildings that are you know, brand spanking new, I mean, they really, the association has a duty a due diligence, of due diligence to check into the, you know, the, the safety of their, their building to make sure there's no construction defect before that 10 years uh, deadline passes, right? Otherwise they will lose, they will lose the right to sue the developer. Yes, we'd argue that this is part of that duty of due diligence is for an association to understand one, the deadlines that it faces to potentially lose its claims, but also to understand the safety and the status of the building itself. So, you know, if they want to do, you know, find out and do their due diligence, who do they hire to go and check out the building? I mean, do they do a structural engineer or a mechanical engineer? I mean, who is it that, you know, is going to tell them that they've got a construction defect? So there are many people that are involved in, in that type of investigation potentially. And there are several steps that we would actually recommend even before you get to that, to that point, Jane. Uh, to determine whether an association has a construction defect or alternatively phrased to maximize the safety and well-being of a building. So I, I'm, I'm going to take a short step back and say we have three recommendations for associations on what they should do to investigate their buildings and maximize the safety of their, of their buildings. So the first is we recommend that an association performs required maintenance. And this sounds simple. It doesn't sound too complicated, but it actually can get quite complicated. And I'll talk about that in a second. Second, we recommend that an association perform a reserve study as required by Hawaii law. You had an episode a few weeks ago about reserve studies and they are valuable tools. And they are valuable because they help an association understand some building components. But our third recommendation addresses the building components that typically may not be in addressed or caught in a reserve study. And that is, we recommend that an association perform a forensic investigation. And this What's gets- a forensic the, investigation? Yeah, this gets to the question you were asking about, about the team. A forensic investigation is where a team typically of either a forensic architect, a forensic engineer, like you mentioned, Jane, or a contractor or some combination of those three 
open up areas of the building in order to investigate building components in areas that are hidden from normal view. So it, a reserve study in our experience in Hawaii is where it, and a reserve study specialist who they do great work and we have a lot of respect for them. A reserve study specialist investigates the useful life or the remaining years that building component items have before they need to be replaced. And it may comment on current construction defects that an inspector can see. And most of these reserve studies in our experience are based on visual inspections of the building. But there are many areas of the building like behind exterior walls or within exterior walls, um, structural conditions within balconies, uh, structural steel in concrete lanai's that are not visible, they're covered up. So you, there is a potential area of exposure for associations that do not know the status of those hidden components. So a forensic investigation uncovers the current condition of hidden components, which allows an association to appropriately budget for those repairs um, so that an association one understands the safety or the safety risks to its buildings, but then also um, sufficiently funds them to recover or to repair those risks. And you know, for this forensic audit, I mean, investigation, how much does something like that cost and how long does it take? Well, I am not a forensic, I don't work for a forensic company in terms of like a forensic architect firm. Each firm probably has its own, um, it has its own fee structures. But I, I will say that the costs of a forensic investigation can be significant. They can also um, be reasonable. So a forensic investigation, in our opinion, doesn't necessarily mean a minimum amount of money that it, or doesn't necess necessarily require a minimum amount of money that an association must spend in order to do this investigation. Forensic consulting companies and, and experts and engineers and architects, they may have flexible um, fee structures where they can, they can adjust their scope based on an, an association's financial capability to spend. With that said, there are law firms out there who if they, for qualifying buildings, particularly buildings under 10 years, uh, and Birding and Weil is one of these types of law firms, who offer a complementary preliminary investigation program where someone like our Birding and Weil and the law firm that we partner with routinely in Hawaii, McKee and Sheldon Mailing, we work with a forensic architect to do a visual inspection of the building, identify areas that may require destructive investigation where building layers are peeled back and then present the information to a board to make a decision on how the board would like to proceed. And so, what do you charge? What do you, what do you, what would a, your firm charge for this service for doing this for a condominium? So for a preliminary forensic investigation, our, our firm and we, we offer a complimentary service here. Now, okay. it, it, it is a, a program where we work with experts or we work with experts to do, um, as I mentioned, a visual and visual inspection followed by some type of presentation. However, that on its own, it, it's not going to be a full investigation where many building layers are opened up. Oftentimes we don't open up building layers, but it is enough to at least give the board information on how it can move forward and these experts that we work with are are very experienced in this line of work there are experts who focus primarily on design and construction and then there are also experts who have practices where they peel back building layers for these forensic investigations so these experts are are very experienced and that what that means is they're able to identify things with their just by looking at them visually um, when many homeowners wouldn't be able to. Uh, 
I mean, there have been many cases where, um, where the lawyers who I work with, we're walking a site and we see things that look like just uh, mere dots or you know mere marks, but uh, our experts are able to say, well, you see that mark right there? That to me, based on how this building appears to be constructed, constructed can be an area where water is getting into the building. Or So there is a lot that an expert can see in a visual inspection, uh, a forensic expert can see in a visual in inspection that an association member might not see. And when should, I mean, when should an association take advantage of this service? I mean, do you, should they wait until year 10? Our recommendation is no. Um, and we recommend that an association start, you know, take advantage of this type of service, which, you know, complimentary means it's free. So take advantage of that type of service early in its life cycle. Uh, particularly- Because if you find something wrong, and you have to do further investigation, you don't want to run up against that 10 year deadline or the six right. year or the two year deadline. Right, yeah. And, and what we find in our cases, Jane, is that many times homeowners are the first line of defense, typically. If an association doesn't perform a forensic investigation, what they rely on are homeowners who experience leaks into their windows, for example, who contact either the association's manager or the board and say, we have leaks at this window. Could you please help us since this appears to be a common area item? Now, if, if an association has several of those types of messages from owners, and then that association subsequently enters into either mediation with the developer through or some other type of alternative dispute resolution or a lawsuit, a developer will point to those communications and say, association, you discovered th this issue many years ago, and therefore you blew the two year or the six year, even if the, a lawsuit or mediation was, was done before the 10 year had run. So there is risk if you allow these types of communications to come in and you don't investigate them. Can I ask you something? In Hawaii, with the construction defect cases, now it's required. I mean, the people who have you know, been in condos for a long, long time, they knew that back in, the, back in the day when the construction defect cases would involve a whole bunch of attorneys and a whole bunch of insurance companies. I mean, it was just, it was just very expensive and time consuming. And so the construction industry went to the legislature and now there's a requirement that you have to mediate, do mediation before you can file a lawsuit on a construction defect, right? So how does that play into your 10 day, 10 year deadline? So let's say you find a claim and you contact the developer and say, hey, we're asserting this claim. And they say, okay, but you gotta take us to mediation first. So let's say you go into mediation. That's gonna take what, maybe six, you know, six, seven months, right? To prepare for it, go through the mediation and complete it. I mean, and you're, you're eating up into your, your statute of repose, aren't you? Yes, long story short, yes. And if this were in California, California has a process where you submit a notice to builder, what, what Cal the California law calls it, where you communicate to the builder based on statute, certain violations of, building standards. And at that point, the statute of repose and the statute of limitations are we'll called paused. So that stops the clock. But we don't have yet. that type of statute in Hawaii, right? That's correct. Yes. Here in Hawaii, if you file a note or send a notice of claim to a builder, which is what the statute requires, that does not stop the statute of repose or the statute of limitations. What stops those is filing a lawsuit. Now, Hawaii law in the on this issue, it's called the Contractor Repair Act. It does allow for parties to engage in mediation, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, but it is, it requires it actually, but it does allow a party or like an association, for example, to file a lawsuit if, Without it, they would they would 
earn through the statute of limitations or repose. So although the statute doesn't have, isn't as plaintiff friendly or association friendly uh, as the one in California in terms of notice, filing a notice with the, or sending a notice to a builder, it does allow you if, if you are going to run out of time and if the mediation does look like it's going to blow through the two year, the six year, or the, even the 10 year to file a lawsuit um, before that those time limits have run up. Well, you know, in Hawaii, what the, there's, a, you know, some typical construction deep, what, what are some noteworthy construction defects uh, specific to Hawaii that people should want to maybe look out for? Hawaii is a marine environment and water is the bane of an association's existence when it comes to construction defects. So water intrusion into all areas of the building from roofs to siding to windows to foundations to concrete to slabs to uh, exterior walls interior walls water intrusion is particularly bad and here in hawaii it's the marine environment has a very salty air so things corrode faster water's bad because it causes metals to corrode it causes wood to get some bacteria, which turns into dry rot. And both of those, metal and wood, which are typically used as structural members, can become compromised by the water intrusion. Now, what we're seeing lately, Jane, are some pretty unique construction defects that, uh, that you know, it's just, it's just how the construction defect field develops. In Hawaii, uh, Around 10 years ago, roughly, there were these uh, structural anchors that hold down a building to the ground or to the foundation, and they were called um, anchor straps. That was a, what was happening where these anchor straps were corroding in the Hawaii environment, due, due possibly to the salty air, salty soils, or, and the uh, humid air. So these straps were corroding and then failing. And so you, you would have homes that were supposed to be tied down or anchored down with steel that no longer are. So um, you, the common description that you hear or analogy that you hear is like in the Wizard of Oz where the, the home blows away. So uh, this, the structural foundation would not be as secured as it as designed. So that was a, a development in the industry roughly 10 years ago. Well, now, what we're seeing now are different construction defects. One of them, another structural one, is uh, we are finding that windows at associations are supposed to be designed to withstand minimum loads from wind. Wind can blow on the windows, it could create, if it blows past windows, it can create almost like suction forces out of the building. So engineers typically design these windows to withstand those types of forces, especially here in Hawaii, where you have hurricanes and tropical storms with very high winds. So what we're finding is that, that some of these windows are installed and or are put in, and they don't meet those structural minimums, which creates a risk of a window failure in the event of a hurricane or tropical storm. So that's a, a, a unique one. Uh, another construction defect that is unique uh, here to Hawaii deals with uh, a building component called um, an, a part of an exterior finish system. There's a product out there called a direct applied exterior finish system. It's typical to Hawaii. It's basically like stucco if you think of uh, stucco buildings. So we found, and, and our experts have indicated to us that you know, several of our in several of our cases, the DEEF system is installed incorrectly for various reasons. Uh, there are many components with the system. It's very easy um, to install them incorrectly, actually. The, the layer on the exterior wall is only an eighth of an inch thick. So you, you can run into issues if the system isn't installed correctly. And 
What we're also finding is that replacement contact contractors, major building contractors in, in Hawaii are not willing to warrant DEEF's replacement system. So warrants a, a DEEF's product that is installed, that they install in place of a, of a defectively installed product. And we are also not seeing letters from DEEF's manufacturers uh, certifying or warranting these products. We've seen letters that warrant the, uh, or excuse me, that warrant the system. We've seen letters that warrant the product but not the systems themselves. So because this product is installed and these systems are installed regularly through, throughout Hawaii, that is a, a unique construction defect or construction issue. But the, uh, there but are the, several we can talk about. Yeah, but the message is to the associations who are listening now is, you know, even for brand new buildings, you can't sit around and just wait for, for something to happen. You have to be proactive and start investigating, especially since you've got these deadlines and you don't want the contractor to walk away and not have, you know, not having to, to fix whatever construction defect they have caused. But, you know, we, we run out of time and, you know, we, I, I have more questions that I never even got to. So can you come back and, 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 and be a guest on another show? Because, you know, we still have more questions to ask. And, you know, this is a very, very interesting and important area, especially after what happened in Florida. I think everybody's really, really concerned about what steps they can take to make sure that their building is safe. You know, even the, the, the ones that are newly built and, and the ones that have been around for a while. So thank you very much for being with us today, Kyle. And um, for, your, for the listeners, uh, please join us next week for another show. And we're gonna be talking about resources. Uh, and, and, and my guest next week is going to be uh, from Murma. The Mo'ili'ili Resident Managers Association. So please join us next week for another episode of Condo Insider. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you.